Hi everyone, my name is Dave Remsen from the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and welcome back to another SciShoot. My colleagues and I in the Marine Resources Center rely on the rich marine biodiversity of Cape Cod to help biologists answer fundamental questions in biology, to understand biodiversity, and to gain insight into the functioning of our environment. For many of the most pressing questions in biology, nature has often found a solution, and our challenge at the MBL is to work with students and scientists to bring these answers to light. In this video, we'll take a look at some of the marine species we find on our journeys around the coast of Cape Cod. Cutopterus, also known as the parchment worm, is a perfect place to start. Parchment worms are marine polychaetes, or segmented worms. They're between six and eight inches long and bright yellow, but although they're quite common, they're very rarely seen. These worms spend their lives housed safely inside a papery, U-shaped tube between two and three feet long that's buried beneath the mud or sand along our coasts. The only part that sticks above the surface are two brownish chimneys with little white tips, about four inches in height. To see these, though, you generally need to be diving, and they're often well hidden among the seaweed and eelgrass on the bottom. The worm in this glass tube is facing to the right and would be oriented just like this in its home tube. Directly beneath the frilly head is a pair of wing-like lobes that hold a web of mucus open like a net, filling the width of the tube. Moving back, we have three pairs of fused limbs that act like pistons, creating a suction that pumps water through the tube and catches tasty organic particles and plankton in the web. Over time, this web fills up with food and then the worm detaches it, rolls it up and passes it to its mouth for a meal. Ketopterus often shares its house with one or of a couple of different species of crabs, which set up house in the tubes and breed within them. One is called Panixa, and the other one is called Polyonyx. If you look these up online, you can learn more about these odd, fuzzy little crabs that only live with parchment worms. Dr. Elaine Seaver is a biologist at the Whitney Lab in St. Augustine, Florida, and an instructor in MBL's embryology course. Her lab studies embryogenesis, the process by which a single cell, the fertilized egg, divides again and again to ultimately form a new individual. You and I started exactly this way. Ketopterous eggs are easy to collect and easy to fertilize on demand, allowing Elaine to explore the way that cells divide early on, which will provide clues that help explain the much more complex patterns of division and organization of cells that turn into tissues, into systems like digestive and circulatory systems later on that result in a new individual worm or any animal. Biologists also study Ketopterus for its ability to regenerate large parts of its body should it be attacked by a predator. In Florida, Ketopterus can be collected in shallow waters, but here in Woods Hole, their collection takes a bit more effort. It starts off well enough with a dive in the summer waters of Buzzards Bay, but when our divers head down, Instead of a rocky reef or a seagrass meadow, their collecting location is a soft, muddy plain where the tubes are easy to see and the mud soft for easy extraction. The technique is to start at one chimney and slide your arm into the soft mud, following the parchment tube with your hands to the opposite chimney. Then with a scoop and a pull, the tube comes free and along with it, a huge cloud of mud fills the water around you and turns day into a soup so impenetrable that you cannot see your hand in front of your, in front of your uh, mask. After that, we just find the tubes by feel. But soon enough, we have our count, and it's back up to the boat, the sun, and another day of collecting at the MBL. Nature can come up with some peculiar reproductive strategies, and some of them play out right here on Cape Cod. Species have to get creative when they're constrained by what nature gave them, where they live, and who they're up against. Take Crepidula which we find on Falmouth beaches in the thousands, and that you might know as the common slipper shell. We actually have three species here, but the one I'm going to focus on is called Fornicata. In case you're curious, if this word rings a bell, and since this is a talk about reproduction, let me clarify that when Linnaeus decided on this name way back when, it's because the word fornix in Latin refers to an arch, just as in the arched shape of the shell. So. When I refer to Crepidula fornicata, just imagine that arch shell. Try not to giggle. 
Now, Crepitula spends most of its life clinging very tightly to the outside of some convex object, like a stone or even a horseshoe crab shell. Once attached, they mostly stay put for their adult life. Like a porcupine, their soft underparts are exposed if they detach, and at that point, they're pretty much done. This works very well, but it's not foolproof. In the video, one of the shells has a hole where another snail, called an oyster drill, went right through the roof, so to speak, and scooped the snail out a little bit at a time. It wasn't enough to kill it outright, but down there on the bottom, word gets around and it was pretty much done. It's not uncommon to find these animals in abundance and piled on top of one another in banana-shaped stacks. There's a reason for this. Nature offers a few general strategies for reproduction. Two strategies on polar opposites that ecologists call the R and K strategies. And this has to do with the amount of resources that each of us spends per offspring. Many marine invertebrates, like clams, are physically separate from one another. Members of the opposite sex cannot mate, so they're forced to broadcast their gametes, which are either eggs or sperm, out into the currents and hope that enough fertilize, hatch, and make it to adulthood to carry on the good clam name. This means millions of eggs, and it means the amount of investment per egg is small. And yet, on average, only two are needed to grow and reproduce and keep the population stable. Baby clams hatch and die by the millions before they ever lay down their first shell. Casting your eggs into the current spreads them far and wide, but at a very high cost. On the other end of the spectrum are the case-selected animals like us, humans. Well, we have just a few children most of the time, and we invest a lot of time and energy to raise them for years before releasing them into the world. All the effort pays off, and as our growing population attests, we end up with more than we started with just about every generation. Crepidula take the middle ground. Instead of making millions of tiny eggs, they make a few thousand. And these eggs are much larger than clam eggs with a lot more yolk. And they can do this because rather than shedding eggs out into the deep blue sea, the female holds the eggs under her body, kind of like a chicken. But if you're going to not send your eggs out into the world to get fertilized externally, then you need a male nearby to fertilize them internally. So how does the female make sure there's a male nearby? Well, crepidula are sequential protandrous hermaphrodites. Say what? Well, there's a word or a phrase that I should unpack for you. So all crepidula start life as males, swimming around in the plankton and looking a little bit like some kind of planktonic helicopter. The word protandrous means male first. Actually, it means first male. Prot or proto usually means first, and andros means male. So protandrous means first male. When these male larvae are ready to settle, they tend not to land in random places. Instead, they follow chemical cues given off by the female who's going to have some eggs that need fertilization. And they settle on her, form a shell, and start to grow, and soon are fathers of an incubating brood. When you find crepidula washed up on the beach, you often see these little males looking kind of like tiny little seeds stuck to the shell of the big female. So life is good for the female, and over time, other males settle on her, eventually also fertilizing some of her eggs. And this increased diversity benefits the female, but now the original male is competing for a limited number of eggs. What to do? Well, this is where the sequential part comes in. The male changes into a female. Now, instead of only having some of his gametes as sperm, making it into the next generation as a father, he gets them all fertilized as eggs by what used to be his competition. Over time, he gets bigger and bigger and grows into another big female, the second of which will be the, eventually a whole stack of these slipper shells stacked on top of one another, with lots of little males on top of them. So, sequential protandrous hermaphrodites are individual snails that have both genders, with the male first, followed by female. It sounds weird, but it works. So, if you find a stack of slipper shells while swimming or beachcombing this summer, take a closer look. So I'm Dave Remsen from the MBL in Woods Hole. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.